I, I appreciate the, the chance to be with all of you and, and to hear your powerful voices. I'm retired now. And so I'm sitting here in uh, El Paso, Texas, and uh, just having some time to reflect. And you gave me this wide open um, uh, topic. So I started thinking about this um, idea of what uh, educators need what teachers need. And as the pandemic was just beginning to close down the world, uh, the National Education Association, my union, took a poll. Uh, we did focus groups. Uh, we, we wanted to know where our three million members, uh, teachers, counselors, support staff, university professors, educators of all types, we wanted to find out how we could be useful to them as their union. And we asked an important question. We said, what do you need to be successful that you don't feel you have? And one word kept coming up over and over again, organically, the word support, which is stunningly not helpful, of course, because that can mean so many things. Financial support, do you have the tools and the resources you need? Uh, or um, not to have to work a second job to support your family, professional support to be able to collaborate, investigate, make decisions, emotional support to ease the trauma of what we're all living through uh, and all of the above. Uh, but I wanted you to know that I know it's more than this horrible uh, time of COVID because we took a similar poll a year before the pandemic and the same word came up over and over again, support. I need support. I don't feel like I have support. And for me, what I heard was more than um, I need training. Um, I'm not sure what to do. I heard, I know exactly what I want to do, and I don't feel anyone is on my side helping me do it. I feel alone, and it's been deja vu for me because support is the word that kept coming up decades ago when American educators began living under the shadow of a national law you may have heard of that our Congress called No Child Left behind. And it was embraced by Republicans and embraced by Democrats. No Child Left Behind was the bipartisan brainchild of idiots. And I mean no disrespect to idiots. It's such a pretty name for a surreal piece of legislation based on the absurd belief that you can reduce what it means to teach and what it means to learn to a simple multiple choice test. More specifically, uh, it required a standardized test in reading and math that was given to all students of all abilities and situations, all students of the same physical age were required to take the same test on the same day we have 52 million school children and all of those children were required by law to score above average. I will pause to let that irony sink in for those of you that teach math because those same politicians apparently didn't score above average in middle school math. We were living with a mandated statistical impossibility that all children would be above average average, but this was, this was so much more than just bad math. These politicians, very few of whom had any experience teaching human type children, rejected um, any need that these children be given equal resources to meet high academic standards. The inequities in the American school system are a national and international shame but fixing resource inequalities would be really, really hard and cost a lot of money. So much easier for them to simply pass a law that demanded equal results and leave it up to us to figure out how all kids would be above average. The law required that the most disadvantaged and impoverished children score as proficiently as the most privileged children who had every advantage. It demanded that children with the most profound 
cognitive disabilities must test at the same high levels as the most academically gifted students. And I had just been elected as a national officer of my union, the year no child left untested passed, the year of our Lord, 2002. And I left my sixth graders with tears in my eyes because I was leaving work that I loved. But I knew I was leaving to take on work as an advocate for teachers, for our professional dignity and our students and their rights to a whole education. And I believed in that work. I still believe in that work. I knew I was sacrificing that lucrative fringe benefit of being in the classroom every day. And the price was not being able to hug my students or laugh at their bad jokes or cry with them when they were sad. I was leaving students I loved. And love has been the essence of my professional work, my curriculum, my classroom management, my communication with families, my individual plans, my expectations for each and every one of them. I tried every day to channel Paulo Freire in every word I spoke to my boys and girls. And he said, I can call myself a teacher only because I love. The foundation of all true education is love. And maybe as much as Paulo Freire, I was also trying to channel those great philosophers, the Beatles, because all you need is love, which of course is certainly not all you need to be a good teacher, but it's where you have to start and it's where you must end up. Love of those students and their futures and their families and love of their, your community and what it means to that community to send them people prepared to live their best lives. Love of what you're teaching, the magic of numbers or history or art or literature. What as a teacher do you love? How does love shape what you teach and how you teach? How does love influence what you measure? It was that foundation of love that caused such pain to me and to my colleagues under a world gone insane with the importance of points on a standardized test to the exclusion of all other types of measures of success. I saw so many tears in so many of my friends' eyes as they tried to balance the love that made them good teachers with a political directive that turned them into accountants ordered to cook the books. Just look good on paper, just check that box. And a lot of them just couldn't do it. They couldn't do it and live with themselves. And many of them, people I love, left the profession that we love. And others taught in secret, hoping that no one would discover they were teaching students to think or discussing an opinion about a current event that was not going to be on a standardized test. They were terrified. Someone was going to find out, shh, don't tell anyone, boys and girls, we're going to learn stuff today. The support my colleagues needed from me as a union activist was to remove barriers from them being able to teach with love. And now might be a good time for me to define what I'm talking about when I say love, because some are gonna think I'm advocating for something soft and fluffy and just so adorable, like I just love those little darling boys and girls. Teachers with this attitude are eaten alive by third graders on the second day of school. They disappear into the mist and we never see them again. There is nothing soft about the fierce love of a professional teacher. Uh, it's a love that believes in a student. It will not accept excuses or laziness. It's a love that lifts up and makes students believe in themselves and makes them try something really hard and slog through something really boring and stick with it until you get to the good part. It's a love that inspires and comforts and discomforts and challenges and celebrates and demands something magical called learning. And our teachers wanna be supported in that. And today for so many of them, and 
For so many yesterdays, too many have felt that they are not supported. The good news is no child left is gone. The proudest moment of my union career as an advocate was standing over the shoulder of President Obama as he signed a new law to replace the most idiotic piece of legislation ever passed by our Congress. And you know that that was tough competition for that designation. The bad news is the storm cloud is still hanging over us as educators. And as I said before, it's global you have something very similar going on in your education communities. I'm sure of it. I run into the same no child left mindless mindset constantly. Uh, before the pandemic, just recently, um, I was on a panel at a conference of business leaders who wanted to uh, opine about education. That is my favorite thing to do. And the topic was, how can we help teachers do more with less? This is not going to end well. There was on that panel with me an economist who was going to show how much more money did not mean higher test scores and a researcher who developed standardized tests who was going to show that these tests were very cost-effective substitutes for teacher evaluations and absolutely necessary so we could rank individual teachers and be able to pay effective bonuses to the effective teachers who got test scores up. And I was there, I'm sure, more as the unionist than as the teacher to defend myself and my colleagues as to why we oppose these amazing new testing technologies and market efficiencies. And so it was finally my turn and I don't defend and I don't attack, I teach. And as someone said, teaching isn't about good answers, it's about good questions. So I questioned the premise of their question. How can we help teachers do more with less? I said, okay, I get the less part. How can we spend less money on education? But I'm confused, I'm not sure I understand the more part. Help teachers do more what? What is it you think we do, I asked them. Because if we aren't clear on what we do, what we're trying to accomplish as teachers, we are all doomed. And if you think what we do is produce correct answers on a standardized test and you want us to do more of that, hey, easy peasy. Because here in El Paso, Texas on the border of Juarez, Mexico, I visited Bowie High School. They have a very large population of immigrant students. And one administrator, he was so creative. He found out how to get the test scores up. He just called in kids who didn't speak English well one by one into his office and humiliated them and told them they should drop out of school before they took the test. And they did. Over 400 of them over three years dropped out and the school's average test scores went up and he got a big bonus. Some charter schools in America got their test averages up by encouraging uh, their students with disabilities that it was really better in their best interest to go back to their neighborhood public school right before they gave the test. So yeah, there are really a whole lot of many creative things educators can do to raise test scores and not spend more money. And you're right, my goodness, it actually does cost less money to cheat children of their futures. And you can still look good on paper, but see, if you want to help teachers do more, you better know what it is we do. I have always been crystal clear in my mind on what it is I do as a teacher. My work is to open a child's mind to its infinite possibilities. And to do that, I'm going to need more.
I'm going to need more time to get to know my students and build a trusted relationship with them. That was very hard to do the year I had 30 nine students in my classroom. I'm going to need more time to collaborate with my colleagues so we can decide how to design and deliver and assess and reboot and refresh academic lessons so that students understand the relevance of what they're being taught, the math, the history, the science, the literature. And I'm going to need some more support assistance to care for their physical and mental health, their social and emotional, emotional development. I'm going to need more time to partner with their families. I'm going to need a little bit more time to build joy into our day. And that means more music and dance and theater and physical education. I want them to know technology. I want them to experience a range of career and vocational uh, experiences. I need more support in all of that. It's going to cost more money and it's going to be worth every freaking penny. There are still many, many people in powerful places all across this globe who are making decisions on education and they don't know what we know. They don't know what they're talking about. And powerful people who think they know everything are so annoying to those of us who actually do. So, okay, I don't actually know everything, but I know this. I know what teachers need from us, from unionists and administrators and researchers and advocates and colleagues. They need us to support their love of their students, to support the love of the whole blessed child, the critical creative mind, the healthy body, the compassionate ethical character. And what we need from each other is to embrace fierce love as the foundation of everything. And everything we need will flow from 